Today we're going to be sharing some radical truths about how your sins have been forgiven past, present, and even future tense. So stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I'm glad that you've joined me today. All of this week I've been talking about spirit, soul, and body, relating that to our relationship with God. God is a spirit, and the truth is that He sees you in your spirit realm. And the problem has been that very few of us have a clear understanding of what our spirit is really like. Now, I'm talking to those who've already been born again, who've made Jesus the Lord of your life, You've got to basically change your identity from who you see in the mirror and what you think just in your mental part to who you are in Christ. And if you have been born again, you are a totally brand new person that was created in righteousness and true holiness. Ephesians 4.24 says that. 1 John 4.17 says you are identical to Jesus in your spirit that it's not something that's going to take place in the future, but right now you are as He is in this world. And we've used so many scriptures on this. And yesterday, a point that I was making out of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, is that after this transformation takes place in the life of a believer, that you are immediately sealed by the Holy Spirit. And this ta is talking about a preservation so that after you're born again and after you receive this right standing with God and your spirit is changed so that you have His faith, His nature, His ability in your spirit, when you sin, you don't lose that because your spirit has been sealed. Any sin or impurity doesn't penetrate into your spirit. Now, that's a tremendous truth. We dealt with that yesterday. Today, what I want to talk about is just continuing along this line of thinking. If this is true... If you receive a brand new spirit that has everything in it that Jesus is, and then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, well then, why can't you just go live like the devil? Why the emphasis on trying to do what's right and act correctly? And I know that many people listening to this broadcast would say, are you just saying then that it doesn't matter how you live, God will still answer your prayers because in the spirit you're righteous. Well, I want to deal with some of that. And uh, again, it'll probably take more than what we can cover here today. We'll continue this even into our broadcast next week. But in Hebrews is a tremendous teaching on this very subject. If I had time, you could teach the entire book of Hebrews. It's dealing with these same truths, talking about that we have a brand new covenant. We've got to get out of the old covenant way of thinking. The old covenant dealt with people based on their performance. The new covenant b deals with people based on their faith and this transformation on the inside, who you are in Christ. So in Hebrews chapter 9, there are three different times that the scripture there talks about receiving an eternal inheritance or an eternal redemption. Now, this is a concept that most people don't have. Most people think that our relationship with God is moment to moment based on our performance and they don't see it as something that's eternal and something that's steadfast and sure. And because of that, they don't have the confidence and the security that righteousness really brings if you understand it correctly. But in Hebrews chapter 9, three different times, it talks about this eternal inheritance. In chapter 10, verse 1, here's the conclusion and the... Uh, response are the benefits of this eternal redemption with God. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? This is a question mark. And what he's saying is, he says, If the Old Testament sacrifices, the killing of animals, could have made the worshipers who offered these things perfect, then they would have ceased to be offered because they would have had no more conscience of sin. That's what it goes on to say in the second verse. It says, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Now, what the writer of Hebrews is doing right here, he's contrasting the way things were in the Old Covenant with the way it is in the New Covenant. And basically, he's saying that under the Old Covenant, sacrifices for sins had to be made continually. 
Every time a person sinned, they had to come bring some sacrifice to atone for their sin. And then once a year on the Day of Atonement, they had to have a sacrifice to cover all of their sins, not only for the ones that they missed, but they just go back and they even remembered the previous ones that the sacrifices had been uh, sacrificed for. In other words, there was just this constant reminder that they were short of what God wanted them to be, and there was a constant flowing of blood. They had to have these sacrifices over and over. But in the New Testament, just like it said in the previous chapter, there is eternal redemption. Jesus died once for all. One sacrifice, not only for all people, but for all time. And so what he's doing, he's contrasting this. And he's saying if the Old Testament sacrifices could have really worked, then you wouldn't have re-offered them because the worshipers being purged would have had no more conscience of sin. Now, the Old Testament sacrifices could not completely atone for our sins because they were only pictures, shadows of things that were to come. But the sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed for you and me dealt with every problem that you and I could ever have. And it not only dealt with it one time, it dealt with it for all times. That's the point that he's making. Let's just skip on down to verse 10 for time's sake. And it says, by the which will, he was talking about through the death of Jesus, a will and testament was put into effect. And in verse 10, he says, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Boy, now that, this is a radical statement. If you can grab hold of what I'm saying right here, this could change your life. This is talking about that sins have been dealt with and forgiven, not only present tense and past tense, but even future tense sins have been dealt with. That's what this is saying. I know some of you are choking on this right now, and you're saying, what is this saying? What about my religious training? Well, I tell you what, we need to get our theology matched up with God's Word. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, through the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In verse 11, he says, And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Remember, he's making a contrast. He says under the old covenant, you had to sacrifice over and over and over again, even for the same sins. It was just temporary. But in verse 12, he says, But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Now see in verse 10, it says that he had offered one sacrifice for sins once for all. I've heard some people say, well, that means once for all mankind. In other words, everybody's had a sacrifice offered, but every time you sin, you got to go to the Lord and repent and get the blood of Jesus reapplied. Well, that's not what it's saying because, again, taken in context, he's contrasting this with the Old Testament that had to offer sacrifices over and over. And in verse 12, he just makes it very clear that the, he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Not talking about for all mankind, but forever, for all time, for one person. Did you know that when you accept Jesus as your Lord, Jesus didn't just deal with your sins up until the time that you made a confession? And then if you go out and sin after that, you lose your right standing with God and you got to pray through and get born again again. That's really the theology that some people have. They believe in being born again and again and again and again. Every time you sin, you lose your right standing with God and you got to pray through. And if you were to die in a situation where, say, for instance, you had just gone out and committed adultery and yet on your way back had a car wreck, and if you got killed, and if you hadn't repented and confessed that sin, that you'd go to hell. That is not what these scriptures are saying. The scripture is saying that you have been sanctified uh, from all sins once for all. And it goes on to say in verse 14, 13, From henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This scripture says that through the offering of Jesus, you have been perfected forever, not just until you commit your next sin. You have been perfected forever. Now, some people listen to this and they say, this can't be because I can guarantee you I'm not perfect. Well, again, you're looking in the flesh. You're feeling your emotional, mental part. 
But I'm trying to say that in the born again part of you, the part of you that was transformed and changed by God, you have been sanctified, Hebrews 10.10, 10, and Hebrews 10.14 says perfected forever. The only way you can understand that is it has to be talking about your spirit. The spirit is the only part of you that has been perfected. And here's another scripture to verify that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. I'll just break into the middle of the thought. He says, You've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. You can't get it any clearer than that. The part of you that was made perfect is your spirit. Your spirit was perfected forever. The one offering of Jesus has totally changed your relationship with God forever. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God so you don't lose that right standing with God. Did you know if you understand this, it will transform your life. Now, I'm going to be spending more time trying to explain what I'm not saying. I am not encouraging people to go live in sin, and I'll be putting that into perspective. But you've got to get this point, that your salvation does not hinge on your performance and your own holiness. It hinges on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have made Him the Lord of your life, then you are secure in Him. He has changed you, and that will not change because you are sanctified and perfected forever. I'll be back in just a minute, and we'll continue to talk about this, and I believe it's going to be a real blessing to you. Before we explain how to receive today's teaching, let us remind you of the special blessing that is yours through giving to the work of the Lord. Now, the anointing on Andrew's life and ministry is a gift from God and cannot be purchased. But your financial support does allow us to share these blessings daily through the Gospel Truth Program. We invite you to join this ministry outreach by sending a check today to Andrew Womack Ministries, P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80934. Or... Use your credit card to make a donation by telephone. You can call 719-635-1111 between 5 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Once again, that number, 719-635-1111. And we want you to know that Andrew's complete teaching on spirit, soul, and body is available in a four-cassette audio album, number T-1027. Be sure to request that album number T-1027 1027 when you make a donation of any amount to Andrew Womack Ministries. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So if you were listening to our first segment that we did on today's program, uh, I should have shocked you. I tell you, most people don't have the concept that we were talking about here from Hebrews chapter 10, whereas it says in verse 2 that you should have no more conscience of sin no more sin consciousness. Did you know that most people's salvation actually revolves around sin? It really does. I mean, most Christians, what they are doing is praying to overcome this fault and that fault in their life. And, and really, the whole thing revolves around praying about our sin. Basically, the church world has presented that if you could overcome your sins and if you could overcome all of these things in your life, then God will accept you. And, you know, that is not the true message of the gospel. Now, I'll be sharing on previous, on, on uh, not previous, but the uh, remainder of programs next week, I'll be sharing with you some things about why we should live holy, etc. But you've got to get this established, that you have become righteous through what Jesus did for you. And this righteousness is in your spirit. It's not based on your performance. You know, I know that there's people listening to me right now because I deal with people all of the time in our meetings and I remember this one lady that came up to me recently and she was crying because she had cigarettes. She, she didn't seem to be able to overcome her smoking. And she was just saying, in a sense, she was saying, God, I know you aren't, you don't love me. God, I know you aren't pleased with me. I can't expect God's best in my life as long as I'm smoking. Now, you know what? I am not advocating smoking. I'm really not. I don't think that it's healthy for you. It's offensive to people. I personally, I've never smoked a cigarette in my life, and it, I can smell people that have smoked. You know, I'm, I'm not advocating it. There are reasons to stop smoking, but I'm saying this, that you do not go to hell for smoking. 
You may smell like you've been there, but you do not go to hell if you smoke a cigarette. God isn't angry at you. And see, if you could understand that, I'm not encouraging you to smoke, but I'm saying that God loves you anyway. And if you could understand that and get to this realization that, boy, God Almighty loves me, even though I smoke, then it would empower you so much, this unconditional love of God. It would empower you so much that then the power would flow through you to break that habit over your life. And on and on we could go, talking about everything else. You know, we have set down this theology that God is offended at every sin that we commit. But the truth is that when Jesus died, He died for your sins. Past, present, and even future tense have been dealt with. And there is no way around these verses that we've used here in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 through 14. You were sanctified and perfected forever. Forever. That means all times. Did you know after you're born again, even though you fail, you are still righteous in your spirit. That sin didn't penetrate your spirit because that spirit was sealed by the Holy Spirit. And so your spirit retains that righteousness and true holiness. You don't lose your right standing with God. And somebody's listening to me and thinking, uh-huh, so you're just saying that it's all right for people to go live in sin. No, I can't tell you everything I know in 30 minutes. I can come close, but... I'm just trying to drive home this point. On our programs next week, we're going to start talking about the reasons for holiness. Let me just basically say it this way, that I do believe in holiness. I do believe in living a righteous life. But I do not live holy in order to have God accept me. I put faith in the Lord Jesus, and when that happened, God put His nature on the inside of me. I became righteous and truly holy, and that right standing with God does not fluctuate based on my performance. But you know what? If I go out and live in sin, I give Satan inroad, opportunity into my life. John chapter 10, verse 10 says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And I can guarantee you that if you go out and live in sin and just allow Satan a free shot at you, he's going to bring sickness, disease, poverty, depression, loneliness, anger, bitterness, on and on it goes into your life. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. But you know what? God loves you independent of your actions. And if you can understand this, it won't set you free to sin, but instead it'll set you free from sin. It's the love of Christ that constrains me to live holy. I don't live holy in order to obtain God's love. I obtained God's love. He actually extended it to me when I didn't even know He existed. Then He revealed that love to me, and when I experienced God's love in my life, I yielded to it by faith. I was made righteous and now I live holy, not in order to have God love me, but because He does love me, it's just my response of love. I love God because He first loved me. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 4. And that's the way it ought to be with you. By and large, we've made a mistake to preach to people that you should be holy so that God can love you. Let me just share a passage of Scripture with you. If you can understand this, out of Romans chapter 4... This will revolutionize your concept of holiness and why we live holy. In Romans chapter 4 and in verse, um, let's, excuse me, it's Romans chapter 6 and verse 20. He says, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now, what does this mean? Think about this a moment. When you were a servant of sin, it's talking about before you were born again, while you were still a child of the devil, before you'd experienced the new birth, you were free from righteousness. What does this mean, free from righteousness? Does this mean that a person who's not born again can't do anything that's righteous? No, lost people can do good things. Lost people may give and sacrifice for other people. There's actually, you know, the Bible says, no greater love hath any man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. There are actually some people who didn't know Jesus that loved another person to the degree that they were willing to sacrifice their own life. They can do right things. This is not saying that a lost man cannot do anything that's right. But what it is saying is that those righteous actions can't change that nature. 
You are by nature a child of the devil until you get born again. And your righteous actions can't change that nature. You just have to put faith in the Lord and receive a new nature as a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't produce it through your own works. And I believe that most people would agree with that. Well, look down in the 22nd verse. It uses the exact same terminology, but it reverses it. It flips it. It says, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God. Now, if in verse 20, when it says you were a servant of sin, if that's talking about before you were born again, now in verse 22, when it calls you a servant to God, this is talking about after you're born again. And it says in verse 20 that you were free from righteousness. That meant that all your good actions couldn't change your nature. You had to be born again. Then in verse 22, it says, you are now made free from sin. What does that mean? Does that mean that a Christian can't sin? Well, we don't have to debate that very much because most of you know that a Christian can sin. And most of us have, have had sins committed against us by Christians. So this isn't saying that a Christian can't sin, but it's saying that in the same way as a non-believer's actions can't change his nature and make him born again, well, a born-again person's actions can't change his nature and make him unborn again. You can't produce the new birth through your righteous acts. You can't stop the new birth or reverse it through your unrighteous acts. Now, I know that that rubs people's religion the wrong way. I know that there's some of you that are offended by what I'm saying, but this is what the Scriptures say. This is in context. I'm not taking it out of context. These Scriptures are back-to-back. -back. It's saying in one sentence, it says that you cannot make yourself a new creature through your actions. You have to be born again. And then in the very next verse, it says, Now you likewise, that you are born again, cannot make yourself unborn again. You can't change that nature through your actions. Again, in verse 22, Romans 6, 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Notice it says that holiness is a fruit, not a root of salvation. There's a difference. You know, fruit is the byproduct of the root and what's happening down there under the ground. The root of everything is already your relationship with God. You have that by faith. That's the only way to have a vibrant relationship with God. And then once you access that, once you begin to understand the things that we're talking about, that you have been sanctified and perfected, your sins, past, present, and even sins you haven't committed yet have already been forgiven. If you ever get hold of that concept, then that will produce the fruit of righteousness, right standing, right action with God. See, we've gotten the cart before the horse. We've basically told people, do right, and then you'll become right. What I'm saying is, no, you can't do right until you've already been made a new person. If you could live holy on your own, you wouldn't have needed Jesus to come for you. The reason Jesus came and died and sacrificed his life is because you could never be good enough to earn God's favor. So Jesus died for you. He took your sins. And not only did he take your sins away, but then he gave you his right standing. He made you a brand new person. In your spirit, you're completely changed. And if you would understand this, that your sins are forgiven, if you would access who you are in Christ, you'd find out that you'd wind up living holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. It would come as a fruit, as a byproduct. You've never seen an apple tree shaking and groaning and travailing and then boom, here's an apple. That's not the way that it happens. It's the nature of that tree to produce an apple. It's the nature of a person who has right standing with God to have that righteousness manifest through their actions. So the good news is that you already have these things in Christ and all you need is to renew your mind to what you have in Christ and then your right actions, holy living, will come as a byproduct as a fruit of righteousness. Let us remind you that giving to support the Gospel Truth broadcast is a wonderful opportunity for you. You can share in the spiritual blessings of a ministry that focuses on the clear teaching of God's Word. And your donations make it possible for Gospel Truth to continue. And let us also remind you that Andrew's full four-tape audio album on spirit, soul, and body is available for a donation of any amount to the work of this ministry. Enclose a check 
requesting the entire tape series, number T-1027, or the single cassette covering today's teaching, and send it to Andrew Womack Ministries, P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs 80934, or you can call us at 719-635-1111 to make a donation with Visa, MasterCard, or Discover, and we'll ship this teaching right out to you. And for those who are in financial crisis, Andrew is offering today's teaching free of charge. We encourage everyone to make a donation no matter how small, but if you're unable to at this time, please know that this teaching cassette is our ministry gift to you. Simply request tape number TK92 when you write or call. I hope that you enjoyed the word that I was sharing today. This has changed my life, and I really believe that it could change yours. And there's much more than what I've been able to do on just this short program. You know, there is tremendous benefit to having this teaching in its its entirety, not broken into little segments. And the best way I know to do that is to get these tapes that we're offering on the spirit, soul, and body. And these tapes are things that are revelation to me. I believe they'll help you. We're making them available to you on a donation basis. And we also have people standing by at our phone center that'll take these tape orders. And also, they'll pray with you and they'll answer questions, anything that they can. Many of these people are good friends of mine. We've been seeing great miracles happen, seeing people healed, delivered. So please take advantage of that. Our phone number is area code 719-635-1111. That's area code 719-635-1111. And be sure and ask for the tapes on spirit, soul, and body. Andrew and his wife Jamie began pastoring churches 32 years ago. And for the past 22 years, they've ministered through Andrew Womack Ministries, headquartered in Colorado Springs. As a pastor, and now as an international Bible teacher and author, Andrew continues to emphasize the good news of God's unconditional love and grace. Through personal appearances and daily radio broadcasts, he's given away three and a half million audio teaching tapes. He's also founder of Colorado Bible College with branch schools in England and Russia. We hope you'll make it a point to join us every Monday through Friday at this same time as we open the Word of God with Andrew Womack.